Good evening. Welcome to Manchester Church of God Wednesday Night Bible Study. It's good to be back here in the house of the Lord again. And good to have everybody here and everybody online. And again, we're going to continue our study and praying like Jesus. And we're going to move a little bit deeper um, into prayer again tonight. Um, any prayers report your prayer request before we start? Into his heart, okay. He sat staff and they come in and done heart surgery today, but he looks good, he's awake. Praise God. Amen. Pray for Sawyer. He needs a healing touch. Shouldn't family that's traveling. Traveling. Remember her heel, yes. Got a fracture heel. Fluid on her lungs, okay. Behavior problem, okay. Yeah, just pray for that family. Heart trouble and behavior problems with a little girl on there. Okay, traveling mercies for Winston and Wilma, Houston. Pray for Houston's brother, he's having some tests for his heart, so pray for him as well. They were just here. So, Jeanette, y'all have any answers, anything yet, or no? I just found out that they're going to uh, instead of going to emergency room, okay. they're going to go in and take it out. Take it out, amen. amen. Thank the Lord, that was benign. Mm -hmm. Yes, remember him in prayer. He needs the Lord. They did it was benign on the cancer, the tumor they were looking at. So that's praise the Lord for that. But just pray for his salvation too, as well, and as protecting him during the surgery that they're going to do. So, Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Yes, Michael Skipper. Yes, remember him. Amen. Well, let's just go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll get started. Lord, we just come into your presence with thanksgiving, come into your courts of praise. Lord, I'm thankful unto you, and I bless your name. Lord, I just so thank you for the opportunity to come and pray to you and know that you hear and answer prayer, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you care enough about us, that you meet our needs, Lord, and I pray for those who need a healing touch. God, I pray that you will go where each person is now. Lord, there is nothing too hard for you. There, distance is not too far for you either, Lord Jesus. And I ask that you'll go to each one that needs a healing touch and touch their body now because your word says that it will run swiftly. And I ask that you will go there now. Lord, I pray that you'll just meet each need here, those who are traveling. I ask for traveling mercies. I pray a special prayer for Marsha, a family that's traveling, and pray for her heal. I ask for speedy recovery, Lord, in Jesus' name. And, Lord, we just want to thank you for what you're going to do. We just thank you for this Bible study. We thank you that we have the opportunity to pray to the Lord God Almighty. And, Lord, we just want to ask that you'll anoint our ears to hear what you have us to say. I ask that you will just meet each need here. And we just want to thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, our key verse has been 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray continually or pray without ceasing. And last, part, last week we didn't get finished with all that I had prepared last week, so we're going to start with that and then move on to the second part. But one of the things I think we forget is that Jesus wants us to pray. I think we just, sometimes we just assume that he doesn't really care or he knows everything already because he's all-knowing, but he wants us to come and talk to him and pray to him. That's one thing he wants. And so in Philippians 4, verse 6 through 7, it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, this is a hard verse to live by, be anxious for nothing, because every one of us, at some time or another, struggle with being a little anxious about stuff. If we're going to the doctor, we'll be a little anxious about test results. Um, you know, children starting school are anxious, starting a new job, retiring. There's all kinds of things that causes us to be anxious sometimes. But he says, be anxious for nothing. And when I say this and I look at the scripture, 
It wouldn't be in there if God didn't think we could do it. So I think most of the time when we're anxious, it's mostly us that's causing the anxiety because we serve a God that doesn't, he's not a bit nervous. I don't, God does not get anxious about anything. But what happens is we let our mind, will, and emotions take over and therefore we become anxious. And he says, but don't be anxious for nothing, but in everything but prayer and supplication. And I think that's the key right there. I know the key for, to me when I begin to feel anxious is to go to the Lord in prayer and pray and, and ask the Lord to help me not to be anxious and then help me to release whatever I need to release for him, for him. And almost, we need to get to the point as a Christian, or I think we need to, is, Lord, that's your concern, not mine. You know, I just need to leave it with you and let you fix that problem because I can't on there. But this is what he says. He wants us to come, he says, to, come to him with everything, with prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving. You know, and the Lord, he doesn't get upset with anything we tell him. Anything we come and pray, he doesn't get upset. He's not a bit nervous about it. He knows what's going on. He knows who we are and what we need in our lives. And sometimes I think we want to pick up the problem ourselves and fix the problem because we are fixers in this country. That's the way we like to do, especially mothers. We like to fix everything, and we can't. And so, therefore, we just have to let, it, let God take care of it. And he says, in the peace of God, if we'll do this, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard our hearts. The peace of God. Isn't that what we all want? So the opposite of being anxious is what? Peace. Peace with God. So when I'm becoming anxious, I have to ask myself, okay, why am I anxious? I need to get back and find out what it is that's causing this, and I need to let the peace of God rule in my heart because that's opposite of anxiety and anxious. Now, I don't know about you all, but, boy, everywhere you go, people are anxious about everything. Anxiety drug is the number one seller in America at this point, I believe, in our life. Everybody's on anxiety. Every, uh, kid, every other kid at school just about on um, anxiety medicine. And I do understand that sometimes you have to need to take medicine. There's nothing wrong with that. But when we have come to a point that anxiety is ruling everything, then I think we have missed something somewhere. And as Christians and as believers, I think part of the reason if we have to stay anxious all the time is we're not really trusting God. And so we have to go back and say, okay, God, I trust you. Now, I wish I could just say, I say, oh, God, I trust you, and that was it, and I got up and didn't have no more worry. I have to keep going back and say, Lord, I lay it with your feet. Lord, I'm trusting you. Lord, I'm believing you. And I have to keep convincing myself, because I don't have to convince God about it. i got to convince myself that it's okay, that he can take care of it. And so that's the struggle that we deal with is with ourselves. But he says, in the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard our hearts and mind if we will do this. And again, that's why I think he wants us to pray. Because I don't, the Lord Jesus does not want us to be anxious. He does not want us to be unhappy. He does not want us to be stressed out all the time. That's not what he has for us. Because he said it's the peace of God that he wants us to have. And so therefore, it is up to us to work at having the peace of God. He's provided it. We have to accept it. And sometimes we have to take it. And so that's the key with us. And again, I think... It, <clears throat> Until we get to heaven, this will always be a struggle for us because we live in this broken world. We have broken families. We are broken ourselves sometimes, and we live in this. And, and learning to trust God will be an ongoing thing. I think we can trust him at different levels, and we can grow deeper by trusting. But until we, and I don't know until we get out of this world that we will ever completely, totally trust him for everything. And um, I, I wish that I could say that we would, but until we live, get out of this world, I don't know that because there will always be something that comes up. And so he says in Ephesians 6 and 18, praying always with prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Be watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Again, Jesus wants us to pray. He wouldn't put the scriptures in here if he didn't want us to pray. So at times, I think sometimes, I think he probably says, wait, no, no, will you just come and pray today? Will you just come and talk to me today? If you'll talk to me today, I'll help you through this. And instead, we just trudge right along, try to make ourselves do what we need to do, and just drudge and hate every minute of it, or just let anxiety and fear and worry just stress us out. And we just have to say, Lord, it's yours. And again, I have to talk to myself and say, God, just, I give it to you. I give it to you. And I may have to go back a hundred times, Lord, I'm giving it to you. And then I'll pick it back up and have to say, Lord, I'll give it to you. And then eventually, if I keep doing it and keep pronouncing, I want to say pronouncing, saying the word over the situation, I'll eventually learn to leave it there because it's the word that has the power in it. It's the word of God that has the power. 
on it. Any thoughts on that about uh, Jesus wanting us to pray? Because the next part I want to talk about, this was real interesting to me. When, when I read this in the commentary, I thought this is just really kind of eye-opening for me. It may not be for you, but it said prayers unprayed will be prayers unanswered. And he talked about in Mark chapter 7, the Syrian woman, had she not prayed for her daughter, she would have never been made whole. And then I thought about the blind man in Luke 18. If he had never called out to Jesus, he would have remained blind. So, looking at these two scenarios, I have to ask myself, what have I been asking for? And then maybe just quit asking. Or what have I not ever asked for? Sometimes I think, we think maybe we're not good enough for God to answer our prayers. I mean, especially if there's things that, that may not necessarily be a need, but might be a want. Or sometimes I think we have prayed, well, God didn't answer it the first time around, so he must not be going to answer it. So we just quit. But I think about the blind man. I wonder how many times he called out to Jesus before Jesus heard him. And in all those times, at this one day, he decided, well, I'm not going to call out to Jesus today. Now, I don't know how many times Jesus walked by him. I do not know that. But if he called out to Jesus, and maybe Jesus went by one day, but then maybe said the next day, I'm not going to call out to Jesus. He might have missed his healing. So for each of us, I wonder how many things we have missed, how many good things we have missed, how many healings maybe, how many things that God has wanted to give us, but we quit asking for him for them because he didn't do it in our time frame. We're all guilty of it. Every one of us are probably guilty of praying for something then quit praying about it on there. And I, I know, like I said, because we are in a success, successful country, and we um, are very wealthy compared to a lot of people. Sometimes if we have a need, sometimes uh, praying financially, or just say, God, I just need you to bless me in this area financially. I think we have a hard time doing that. Does, do you think that, or is that just me? I think sometimes if I say, Lord, I would just like to have a blessing. Again, I've told you about the car. I just said, Lord, I, I looked at some cars, and I said, Lord, this is what I would really like to have. And I'm driving to Tullahoma. I said, Lord, I would, can I just tell you what kind of car? I almost felt guilty about telling the Lord what kind of car I wanted. I said, I want a burgundy car with light gray interior. I didn't want to, because all the cars were black interiors. I said, I don't want a black interior car. I want, he should be our best friend. What kind of car I want. You know, but, but sometimes I think we feel guilty because maybe that's not really a need, so to speak. But sometimes he wants to give us what we want. Don't we? Do we only just give our children what they need? We give them a lot of stuff that they want. And sometimes I wonder as Christians, have we missed so many blessings? And I'm not necessarily talking about financial blessings and things like that, but or have there things we've missed? What about the gifts of the Spirit? That's one of my scriptures on down here. That's what we're going here. But we have not because we ask not. But why is it hard for us sometimes to say, God, you know, I really want a burgundy car with a light gray interior. Something that you can't see. Well, I will tell you. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, but the more we pray and the more we draw closer to him, it gets even less odd, or so to speak. Yeah. It's not as odd. Because it almost comes in like he walks and talks with you. And says, by the way, I do have a burgundy car with light gray interior. <laughs> you pray for the one you wanted, yes. Pray for a house, yes. Mm-hmm. Exactly what you said. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. God, hey, and, and you know, I think he wants. I think he's more anxious to help us than we more are to ask him. You think? 
I think so. I th That's a property? Mm -hmm. Well, don't pray like Houston because you said, Lord, if this house needs to sell, I need it in a week, and, you know. <laughs> and the house sold in a week <laughs> when you have to move. <laughs> but no, I just think we have lived sometimes beneath. Go ahead, Houston. Yeah, it's <laughs> my problem down there. Yes. It's too hard for me to ask those things. I think I would have thought that. Maybe, yeah. You think maybe? Somehow, you know, I, I, I would have thought that. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, the <laughs> she's got you, huh? <laughs> but no. You're right to do that. <laughs> but yeah, I, I do. I do think sometimes when we. Be, because women, I think sometimes we think if it's not a spiritual thing, God may not do it. Right. I, I think we feel like if it's not a spiritual thing. Well, you know, one thing you have to ask on this subject, you know, if that gets on the phone, you have not because you're asking. Mm-hmm. You know, if you need me to mow your yard or something, ask me. Ask me to mow my yard. Oh, well, exactly. I hear him say it all the time. You have not because you're asking. Mm-hmm. 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 But, but I do think sometimes as Christians, we, we have a little hard time because we don't think asking God for something, a car, maybe is not spiritual. You must have sell your house. Mm -hmm. Three days. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. And I thought, man, I don't want to do it. And I, two, three times I had to leave my house because people came on Thursday night, you know, Friday morning, mm -hmm. and uh, then they had to stay up till Saturday. But the person that came Friday, he was the one that bought it. One that bought it. So, so you, you, you hate to sell your house. Ask the Lord to help you, and he can help. I mean, I think he's more anxious to help us, than, again, than we are to ask him. Mm -hmm. Because he has a property in Florida. Mm -hmm. And since we built our little pole barns and tried to get it ready, mm -hmm. two hurricanes have come through mm -hmm. in the place that we. And while I'm driving down there, mm -hmm. my husband's going, Is it going to rain? It's going to be a, it's gonna be a tropical storm. I said, Jesus, you look like it. <laughs> and God said, It's going to rain. It's going to rain. It's going to pass over us. Yeah. Two times it's coming. Two times? Mm -hmm. it went. Oh my! Never yeah, hit my never hit your place, two place. And I praise God that He does it, but it's like, yeah, if you don't ask, we don't ask. Yeah, and sometimes, like I said, my scripture down here says James two four says, you know, it says you lust, you do not have; you murder, and you covet. And He says you fight more, yet you do not have because you do not ask. And I think it's really strange that He puts you fight more down here. Who do we fight more with ourselves? We fight more with ourselves more than we do anything about asking God for stuff. We do. We, we, are, we are at war with ourselves more than we are with anything else. And he said, we do have not because we ask. And like Wilma we, we said, Jackie said, you, you know, if you don't ask me to mow your yard, I ain't going to be able to mow your yard. We don't know, you know. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. 20 years. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 And I think sometimes, like I said, again, I think the biggest thing we all struggle with is, okay, it's just me, God, asking for something. But, but, I, but really what it is, and this is, I think the devil convinces us of this because a lack of prayer demonstrates a lack of faith sometimes. We don't ask, so we can't, if I'm not praying and asking, then I don't know if my faith is working for God to give it to me so, sometimes. And then sometimes we have a lack of the trust of the word of the Lord. He said, I'll supply all of your needs. Mm -hmm. My need today might be a new car. It might need a good friend today. He says, I'll supply all of your needs, whatever your needs are. I will supply whatever they are. And I think sometimes we ha have a hard time accepting that. 
And he says, no, and we'll get on over here a little bit. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here. Um, because he's promised that he will bless us in um, Ephesians 3, verse 20 through 21. He says, he has promised in his word he will bless us. Now, he says, to him who's able to do it exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. I want to go back up and let's talk about according to the power that works in us. What power works in us? How about asking in prayer? The Holy Spirit works in us. Is prayer powerful? Is believing the Word of God powerful? Is the Holy Spirit living inside of me powerful? So if I'm being led by the Holy Spirit, can my words be powerful? And he says, according to the power that works in me. So sometimes the power that's working in me may not be faith. It may be unbelief. So I have to watch what power I'm allowing to work in me. I need to allow the, the Word of God. I need to allow faith to work in me and the power of the Holy Spirit to work in me. In Mark eleven twenty four, 24, it says, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you'll receive them and you will have them. Now, he didn't say whatever spiritual things you pray. That's where I think we have a hard time. If I only pray spiritual things, it'll be okay. But again, if we can pray for a car. We can pray for a house to sell. We can pray for a job. We can pray for a friend. He says, therefore, say whatever things you ask for when you pray, believe that you receive them and you can have them. I just, again, I think he's on the side. Will you just ask me for a friend? Will you just ask me? I just prayed and asked the Lord for a husband. I'm telling you, these young girls, these young boys, they need to pray and ask God for the husband. And when, you know, it's just those things, I think, that we just try to, we want it all spiritual and that it cannot ever be about us. Now, do I think we need to make it all about us? No. But I do believe we live a lot beneath of what he has for us because sometimes we feel like it's, well, that's not spiritual if I pray like that. But yes, it is spiritual because he says he'll supply your needs. He says, therefore, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe you'll see, receive them and you can have them. And he says, I'll supply all of your needs. What? According to his riches and glory. He owns this whole earth. He can put a house where you need it. He can put a car where you need it. He can put a husband where you need it. If we'll just ask him to believe it. The other reason we pray is we demonstrate our faith in God that, we will, that he will do what he has promised in his word. That's one of the reasons we pray because we have faith that God will answer. And then when we pray, it helps us to know that he's, what he's promised in his word. But I've got to know what the word says. I've got to know the word says he'll supply all my needs. I've got to know that the word says ask what you want and you can have. Now, I'm not a name and claim it person because heaven knows if we ask all, every one of us asked the Lord for a million dollars in here, probably wouldn't none of us come back to church next week. So the Lord knows who can handle it and who cannot handle it, you know. Do what? I'm sorry. Yes, it's a way we communicate. He wants to talk to us. He really does. That's one of the things he says. The what prayer is the means of plugging into his power, first of all, and then it's again defeating Satan, Satan, and then communicating with God. That's what we do with prayer. That's what it is. The that is our primary means of knowing who God is. Him and his uh, seeking him, praying to him, and reading his word. Those are the ways, the primary ways that we know who God is. On here, he's given us his word. But yet he also says, pray to me. Now, again, I've just talked about so many times. You've heard me talk about this. I cannot imagine praying to some unknown God that just sits up like a statue somewhere that has no clue during some prayer. I pray to a God who's alive, who's powerful, who's living inside of me, and I can feel his presence, and I can feel his power. And he talks with me, and he walks with me. It's not something that's some unknown that just sits somewhere in a corner that we come by on Sunday or once a week and just pray to it. 
in my deepest, darkest night at home when the, the enemy comes in and the devil says, this is not going to happen. And I say, all my children shall be taught by the Lord and grace will be the peace of them because when we lay down at night time, what comes to our mind? Our kids. So this is the key. And again, primary, uh, prayer is our primary means of seek it, uh, seeking God in the work of others. And this is, I want to, want to read this to you here. Because we can pray for others. And our primary um, means of, of seeing God work in their lives is by our prayers on here. And we're going to look at Hezekiah in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 14 through 19. And we're going to look at this prayer because it says a lot to us as individual, as people who need to praise the Lord. It says, And Hezekiah received the letter from the hands of the messenger and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Then Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and you hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see and hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to, to reproach the living God, to reproach the living God. Truly, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nation in their lands and have cast their gods into fire, for they were not gods, but the work of man's hands, wood and stone. Therefore do they destroy them. Now therefore, O Lord our God, I pray, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord God and you alone. And then in verse 35, and it says, 2 Kings 19, 35, And it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Syrians 185,000. And when the people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. Now, let's go back and look at Hezekiah. What happened? He received word that they were going to take over and they were going to kill them. Basically, is what he received the words from. And he said he, he received a letter from the messenger and he read it. And the Bible doesn't say that he began to worry and fret and discuss it and talk about what kind of uh, what kind of plan we're going to have against it. He says, and he said he read it, and Hezekiah went to the house of the Lord. And then he says, and he spread it out before the Lord. How many times have we gone before the Lord and got down on our face and Lord, here is here's the problem. Here's the situation. Now, we will do it eventually. But I dare say it is hard for all of us when it says when, when he read it, then he went and spread it out. Most of the time we think about it, we stir in it, we dig in it, we talk it over, we do this. And a lot of times taking it before the Lord and spreading it out is the last thing we do. Because a lot of times we try to figure the answer out ourselves. And here he says, And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it out. Then Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. And this is who he says, You're the Lord God. You're the one who dwells in the high places. What he said, he took the problem to the God, and then he acknowledged God for who he was. God, you are the one who can handle this problem. He says, You are the one alone. You are God. You alone are the kingdoms of the earth. You made the heavens and the earth. This little problem here isn't too much for you. If you made the heavens and the earth, killing these 185 people is not bad, not much. You can do it. I'm sure he didn't say that to him. Or, well, he might have. I don't know. But this is what he's saying. He understood the problem, but then he went to for the throne room of God and he acknowledged God for who God was. He says, you are the God. You and, and I just wish that we would just get this in our spirit that we understand that we're praying to the person who made the heavens and the earth, who gives us the air that we breathe, who causes the sun to rise and the sun to set. Why can he not handle my little problem that I have? And why do I think I need to help him handle the problems that I have? Now, I know there are things we're required in life to do and there's things that we have to do. I understand that. He requires us to do things. But... You and I don't have that kind of power. We don't have the power to hang the sun and the moon and the stars. And this is what he says. And then he says, you've made the heaven and earth. And he says, oh, Lord, incline your ear to me. Lord, hear me. Your eyes, oh, Lord, and see me. Hear the words of this. Hear the words what's been said to me. Well, the Lord already knew what had been said. And then he says, the king of Syria, this is what he talked about. And he says, this, he says, the king of Syria. And then he talks about them and says, and they cast their gods into the fire because they were not gods. 
They basically burned up. They were made with men's hands. They were wood. And he says, therefore they destroyed him. He says, and Lord, save us from your hands. He said, because you are the Lord God and you alone. I thought about this. Here's a note I wrote on the side here. He didn't, Hezekiah didn't run to the lawyers to see what he could get taken care of that way. He didn't run to get the army together. He went to the house of the Lord and laid it out before the Lord. I think sometimes we are afraid to be truthful with God. I think sometimes we're afraid to lay it out. Lord, I'm, I'm just struggling. I, I don't like this situation. I'm having a hard time with this situation. I mean, God knows how we feel. But he, we can tell him how we feel and say, God, I know you're God. But this is what I'm struggling with. This is how I'm feeling. But again, I think we want to go to God sometimes so holy rather than saying, here I am, God. I'm desperate. I'm broke. I have nothing. I can't, I can't deal with this no more. I've struggled with this. You know what? He answers that just as well as he does going to God and saying, God, I got it. I mean, he does. And he wants us to come to him. He wants us to talk to him. And then when we go there, after we lay it before the Lord, we acknowledge who he is. God, I know you can handle this. I know you can answer this prayer. I know you can resolve this situation. I know you can change my circumstances. And so this is what Hezekiah did. And then in verse 35, we understand that then they are all killed. And again, I pray that for you, for me, for everyone in this church, that may God find us often before his throne, laying our needs out before the Lord. For we have a high priest in heaven who can identify with all that we go through. Everything, nothing we could say to God would shock him. Mm -mm. No, no. On you. And so this is the key, I think, with us is here with just like Hezekiah. We have to acknowledge who we're going to, and we have to go before the Lord. And again, I wonder how much worry and fear and anxiety and stress and mistakes would, we would have kept ourselves from if we just went before the Lord and laid it before the Lord first thing. I know we've all taken things into our own hands and done things and made decisions maybe without even thinking about what the Lord wants on there. But this is what he wants because he is a high priest in heaven, who in heaven can identify with all that we've been through. They ain't, neither one, None of us here been hung on a cross, have we? No. Never been beaten like that. We may have felt like we were getting beaten like that at times, but nothing like what he went through. And then he ascended into heaven and he's there at the right hand of the Father. And I think he... You know, I just, maybe my imagination just hold on. I just see him dancing up there saying, just come to me. Just, I, I can't, oh, they're about to come and pray. They're about to come and talk to me. I think he gets excited. And then he says, oh, they didn't come. You think he feels sad? I'm there. And then he goes on into James, and he talks about James 5, verse 16 and, and 18, and because I want to hear this part here. He says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the, rain, and the, and the heaven gave him rain, and the earth produced its fruit. We think Elijah is some big holy man that just, and he was. But here the scripture says, hey, Elijah was a man just like we are. So don't tell me that if we go to the Lord in prayers that our prayers can't avail and produce much. Because the Bible plainly says it here. Hey, Elijah was just, he has a nature just like us. We again would think him as some magnificent holy prophet and he was. And there's just tremendous things in the Bible about him. But here he says, look, he's a man just like you are. And he prayed it did not rain. Now I need somebody to start praying for or it to rain. We need some rain here. We need for it to rain. I hope Elijah has not prayed for it not to rain here, but we need for some, some us to pray for it to rain here because we could use a little rain. Brandon may not be praying for rain, though. You're fixing the shop, aren't you? he be praying against the rain, so maybe that's what it is. <laughs> Give you one more week and let it rain after that. 
But again, that's, that's the way I think that God wants us to look at prayer. And I think sometimes we made it such a drudgery. And I think sometimes I think that's why the church lacks praying because we have taken the excitement out of praying. We have made it a drudgery. But we should be excited to say, I'm going to the King of Kings. I'm going. If we were going to see the King and Queen of England, how excited would we be? Well, <laughs> not at this point, but you understand what I'm saying. But you think about it. We get excited more about other things than we do coming to the throne room, praying to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And again, I hope we don't make it some kind of ritual thing that we just feel like, well, if I don't say the right words, what if I don't say this? Again, as you see, Hezekiah just took it and laid it out for the Lord. Lord, here it is. They're going to kill us. If you don't do something, I might have to go and say, Lord, I'm laying this before you. I need you to intervene in this. I'm not doing good with this, God. I need you to help me with it. We all have things in our lives that we want God to help us with. Any thoughts on that before we move to the next part? Yes, we do have an adversary that makes it seem like drudgery and difficulty. And if you don't believe it, I talked with the pastor because I talked to him a little bit about um, possibly the month of October on Sunday night coming together and praying over our country, praying over this election every Sunday night. Now I want somebody to come and count the numbers. Because we do not like to pray. We much rather worship. Ooh, it's quiet. Prayer is a part of worship. But we had much rather sing rather than taking time and getting to the throne of the Lord. Yeah. Or how to say it. If I want to pray over my food everywhere, mm -hmm. everywhere, but it gets into more things and they're like, Oh, are you just going to pray all day? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So. I think one of the things, too, um, sometimes prayer can be just being still yeah. and listening on here. Um, but no, I think, I think sometimes it is hard for us to know how to pray. However, I, one of my things that has helped me tremendously is learning to pray the word. Pray what God's word says over this situation. What does God's word say over my children? But now if I don't know what the word says, that's okay. Take your Bible out and read it. Lord, you're, you're, the Bible says this. I'm praying this today over my family. I'm praying this day over my kids. I'm praying this over my finances. Because he says his word will not return void. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I have um, one that I pray out of. Um, I don't pray every chapter. Uh, it is probably one of the most tremendous prayer books I've ever heard because basically it prays the scripture over situations, and that's what it says, you know. And, and, the, and one, of the, one of the things that it says, it says, um, I'm, I come to you, I get under the, uh, the covering of the early morning riser. I declare your lordship over my day. And that's how it starts on one of the prayers. And I probably wouldn't have thought of that myself had it not been in that book, but that's how I pray over myself. Like I declare your lordship over this day in my life. Let your lordship be ahead of my life. Um, and I will tell you this book has got several prayers in it. And um, it talks about releasing salvation, healing, deliverance over yourself. It talks about releasing finances over yourself. And it gives you the scripture to pray over yourself. And it's um, the person's name and Kimberly Daniels is who it is. And I don't agree with everything that's in this particular book. But her, his name is Kimberly Dan Daniels. And there are some tremendous prayers in there about praying over your children, praying over yourself, and praying God's blessing on them. And just, uh, to me, you can just write yourself scripture. Look up all the scriptures that says, what is, if I need a financial need, look up the scriptures for the financial needs. You write them down and pray those scriptures over you. If I need healing, write down what he says about this. If I need friends, pray what he says about having... Uh, fellowship with one another. If I need a house, you ask Google a lot. Pray for this. 
But, but I think, like you said, sometimes we, we don't know what to say. I, I, don't, I don't believe I've ever gone wrong with just praying God's word back to him before you know, on them. And I think sometimes, some, we probably think sometimes our well, that prayer sounds foolish. No. Again, if God cares enough to give me a car, a burgundy car with a light gray interior, he cares about everything in my life. And again, we have not because we ask not, and I think we as Christians sometimes, because if we think it's not spiritual, maybe I don't need to be asking for that. I want to know, does anybody pray here for a million dollars for this church yet? Gone? Yeah, we know what happened to a church. Our church in Mississippi, a man walked in and gave him $1.5 million to pay off the church there. Two years ago, they said a year and a half ago, wasn't it? It can happen. That pastor prayed. He said, Lord, I need an answer. I need prayer. I need to know how to handle this debt, or I need somebody to come here and pray to pay this building off. The pastor before. We don't understand God's timing and God's way, do we? Right. No, we don't. I mean, this, and, and, and the guy came in there. I mean, so is Manchester any different? I mean, we don't have debt here. We do not owe on this building. But we need newer buildings, bigger place. We need more things. And God can provide. Pass out the neighborhood <laughs> when you go in. <laughs> but you know, this is the thing. If he can do it for that church, he can do it for this church. If he can provide a car for me, he can provide a car for you. It may just be your first car. If he can provide a house for Marsha, he can provide a house for us, all of us. He can supply our needs. Yes, yes. It really does us because Houston signed on the note. That was a big relief. <laughs> Because Houston was the, one of the first signers on the note at that church. So when they paid the church off, it was a lot for it was He was not a trustee there any longer because we were here. But how encouraging is it? Because we know that personally happened. We went to the note burning. We were there. And it was so exciting. That's the same God here in Manchester. That's the same God that goes home with me. Maybe I only need $100 this week, but God... You can provide it. You can provide it. But the biggest thing is, he's waiting for us to ask. I'm going to start on, we're going to look at the next part. Anybody have any thoughts on this? I mean, I'm, are you ready to shout? Land for the church. I, I, I said, well, Lord, well, that might work. <laughs> is that our land? Mm-hmm. It, 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 mm-hmm. it, 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 to raise money. Exactly. We have to listen to God, don't we, ourselves? Personal. Mm-hmm. Yes, He can. But God provided, didn't he? And how many times have any of us seen it? How many times have we seen it in our own individual lives? 
But again, I think we can see it more if we'll just allow God. Yes, Winston's mom at 104 says we live for uh, below our privileges. We do. I do believe we do. But sometimes we think the privileges mean well. Maybe I have this big fine house, and there's nothing wrong with you got a good fine house. This, but maybe the opportunity to give money to someone who doesn't have it. Those are privileges and things as well on there. I would love to be able just to build a new building here. I wish I had the money just to build a new building here, whatever we need. I know God can provide, but he's the uh, mayor. And he, he's a marvelous God. And I think he's an all-knowing, all-wise God. He knows who to give a million dollars to and who not to give a million dollars to. Because there's some people would not give a million dollars to the church. Lord, send us a million dollars here. We need him. Anyway, so now we're going to go to the... We're going to go to the next part of this, and I think this, we're going to start looking at, um, we're going to look at a couple models of prayer, one of them in the Old Testament and one in the New Testament, um, and maybe you won't, don't think of the tabernacle as a model of prayer, but it is, and this was just so rich to me, and I hope it, I don't know how much we're going to get done tonight, we're a little, running a little bit long, but anyway, that's okay, or I'm running long on scripture, short on time, <laughs> so yeah. But um, again, the, most, uh, the, the model prayer that we're most familiar with is the Lord's Prayer. And probably most of us has never thought, have never thought about the tabernacle as being a model of prayer. But I'm going to break it down a little bit, and we're going to look at that. Um, the premier model for prayer was in, the old, uh, was in the Old Testament as a tabernacle. This was the pathway into God's presence from the world. And if you want to read about the tabernacle, go to Exodus 25. We're not going to go through that because it's a very long chapter. It's got a lot of stuff in it. But it says it has a lot of wisdom in it. But it describes how the tabernacle was to be set up. God told Moses how to make him a sanctuary that he could come and dwell in. And that's what he did. And so Moses prepared this. And so we're going to look at the tabernacle as examples for us as to what the, um, what part of the tabernacle, um, I want to say, was for this thing, particular areas. And we'll, you'll see as I'm going, the outer court preparation was for the presence of God. That's what the outer court was. Half of the tabernacle is dedicated to the courtyard, which is entirely given to preparations for God's presence. The other half to participation in and in his presence. So we're going to talk about the outer court first, okay? The outer court included the gate, the brass altar, and the, le and the lever. So let's talk about the gate. And I know, I, if any of y'all ever looked at the scripture, you've seen the tabernacle and you've seen the gate there. So what do you think the gate would look stand for? Entering in. But the gate is there so that we can enter in with praise and thanksgiving. We enter God's tabernacle. How do we enter God's tabernacle? Praise and thanksgiving. In Psalms 100, verse 1 through 5, it says, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who's made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. We are to enter his gates, what? With thanksgiving and into his courts for praise. And we're to be thankful in him. And you know I pray like that's how I begin my prayer. Every time I pray, this is how I pray. Of entering his gates with thanksgiving. Lord, to come through your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise. I'm thankful unto you and I bless your name. That was the gate there. And that was the, the, the significance of the gate is that we're to enter his gates with thanksgiving. So that was the first thing there was the gate on there. That's how we were to come to the gate. That's how we're to come to the presence of the Lord is with thanksgiving and praise on there. And he says, then the, then the brass altar. The brass altar is characterized by the blood and fire. It is a place of death. Literally, it means a slaughter place. Now, how does that have anything to do with prayer? Sacrifice. There must be death to sin. This is the moment we are to realize that the wages of sin is death and repent of our sins. So after we've gone into the gate with thanksgiving, we're to come to the altar where they ask the Lord for forgiveness of our sins. Okay. If I never knew I was a sinner, I could not enter the, the gates of thanksgiving because I wouldn't know how. So I would need to know that I had been a sinner. So I think here he's talking about we had to realize that we had sinned. So but when we went to the gates with thanksgiving, then we'd go to the altar because we sin. 
We have to ask forgiveness of our sins. We have in Colossians 3, uh, verse 5 through 9, it says, Therefore put to death your members which are in the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now, yourself, but now you yourselves are to put off all these. Basically, when I realize I have I've been born again, the altar, the death to my sin is I'm going before the Lord's throne saying, God, forgive me of my sins. I can go to the altar and say, ask the Lord, take the sins away from me. Help me to not have these habits. Let you Let the altar... Help me to understand that the blood of Jesus covers me and I do not have to have these. I do not have to do the sins. I can live above these things. So we've entered the court with thanksgiving. We've come to the altar and this is where the death of sin is. Lord, forgive me my sins. Um, we all sin. Uh, I hate to tell us, you know, if you don't think you do, I'm sorry. We all have sin. Some form of sin that we do because, again, we live in this broken world on there. And then the second part, it, it, it says, um, he says, but now you put off with all these anger. He said, do not lie to one another since you put off the old man. Again, we have the old man gone. We've been born again, but we still have to deal with sin. We still have to deal with our sin nature until we get to heaven. So therefore, there will always be a need. We can enter with thanksgiving, but there will always be a need for forgiveness. I just say, Lord, forgive me my sins and shortcomings. I may not have even really... Because intentionally, I don't get up in the morning and say, I'm going to sin like this today. None of us do. But there are things that we do that sin. And so therefore, they may just, uh, sins of omission, sins of commission. There's things that we do that are sin. So therefore, part of the prayer is going to the Lord asking for forgiveness. And then the next part is the death to self. We have been redeemed and free from the slavery of sin. So we have to ask ourselves, what do we need to do to be of this freedom? So, again, we've gone to the courts for Thanksgiving. We've asked for forgiveness of our sin. But then there's this fleshly part of us that we have to die to the flesh. And he says we've been redeemed and freed from the slavery of sin. So, again, what do I, I have to ask myself, what do I have freedom to? If I've been given freedom, what do I have freedom to? Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. I've been born again. I've been freed from sin. What for? To become a living sacrifice for the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, because this is our acceptable and reasonable service. And he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed what? by the renewing of our mind. So again, like I said, I've come to the praise and worship. I've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm dying to myself, and I'm living in freedom to be more like Christ. I'm living to, because I'm bringing my body as a, as a sacrifice to the Lord. Not to be, I'm being free from the comfort, being conformed to this world. In our own flesh, we cannot live above sin. We have to have the Holy Spirit inside of us. We have to be willing to acknowledge that I have sin in my life and ask God for forgiveness of our sin. And as we're doing this, as we become more in tune with him, come renewing our, our Lord Jesus Christ, then we become more and more, I want to call it, sanctified. Sanctification comes along as we grow spiritually. But again, we have to acknowledge that we have been saved, we've been freed from sin, and we've been free to these things to be sanctified. Death, sin does not... But I can have freedom from sin if I want it. Now, I'm not saying that we will not always have some kind of sin, but if I want to be, have freedom from sins in my life, I can have it because I can trust the Lord Jesus Christ, ask the Lord to remove these things. But I'm the one who has to quit doing the sinning. And that's where the consecration and the sanctification comes in. I'm changing my mindset. I'm being renewed in my mind to where the things that I used to want to do, I don't do anymore because I'm spending more time with God. I'm being transformed by the renewing of my mind on there. Because where does sin start? In our mind. No murderer, I don't think, just goes out today and says, I'm murdering somebody today. He's probably thought about it for a long time. Or she's thought about it on there. 
So this is the thing what we're trying, what I'm trying to, and I hope I'm not confusing you totally because you, in the Old Testament, these were the steps that they went to for purification, and, and the, this is what they had on here. And then the next part is unity and reconciliation. The crowning sacrifice of the five basic offerings was the peace or fellowship offering. The altar was transformed into a table, and the worshiper received back a portion of the sacrifice to eat. This is dinner with God. Think about that. What happens when we have dinner with someone? We talk, we visit, we eat. Most of the time we laugh. Enjoy their company. So when I am learning to about the unity and reconciliation, the peace offering on this altar helps me to understand that the worshiper received back a portion of the sacrifice that they gave. So when I enter God's throne, when I praise and worship with him, I can get back part of what I gave to him because he's dining with me. I'm not just dining with him. He's dining with me. And Winston, I know you'll know this song, Come and Dine. Come and dine, the master calleth, come and dine. Jesus has a ta- ta- table set where the saints of God are fed. Y'all are not old enough to know these songs. <laughs> he, yes. He calls his chosen people, come and dine. Come and dine, the master calleth, come and dine. I told you I'm almost as old as Winston. But anyway, so this is the thing I think sometimes that we, we just take it so for granted, but just to think that as we're going into here, we're going into the prayer room and we're spending time with the Lord Jesus Christ, he is dining with us. And most of the time, I dare say, Lord, bless this food, bless this, this, bless my half, watch my day, and we're up and gone. I know, I'm guilty. But then there's times when you dine with the Lord Jesus. And he speaks. And his presence just so invigorates you and just fills you up with worship. And this is where he wants us to be. I wish we could live like that every day, every minute of every day. But again, we live in this broken world. But if you've never experienced coming to the table, sitting with the Lord, and just let him saturate you, it's such a wonderful thing. It's just a wonderful thing. Because it's in those times that your saturation comes that the Holy Spirit is changing me and transforming me and moving me from one step to the next step in my life. That's what he does for us. Because because we're coming to the table from the very beginning. We're sinners. And now we're invited to stay at the table because he's our father. He wants to visit with us. He wants to spend time with us. And again, like I said, if we're serious about prayer, if any of us are serious about our prayer, then God will come after our sin and our selfishness. He will transform us. If we yield and surrender we'll end up being spiritually fed. Now, I know sometimes there are habits and things in our life that it takes us longer to break, but the Lord knows our heart if I'm really trying to, or if I'm not on here. But we will surrender these things, and we'll spend time at his table with him and praying with him. Then we'll end up being spiritually fed, and you can't be spiritually fed and not be spiritually growing. That's all there is to it. And sometimes I think we miss him. Let's talk about the labor right quick. Like um, The next step toward God is the labor. Here we pray for purity. Uh, we embrace the quest to be a sanctified life. The labor was a mirrored brass filled with water. One saw the reflection of himself, the need for cleansing, and the ready water for purification. Two things were regularly washed. Hands, which are like our deeds. Feet, which are like our habits. Every pass of the labor required a pause for self-examination. And any time we come to the throne of the Lord, we have to pause and ask for an examination. Lord, this is what I said. Lord, just create me a clean heart. Show me if there's anything in me that's not like you. Show me. And again, this represents the word of God as a mirror that we see Christ and see in him. As we see him, we want to become more like him. And this is the labor, what the labor did. You, you 
can see the re reflection of yourself in there. And sometimes I think we need to stop and, and take a good look at ourself and do an inward re reflection. Okay, where am I spiritually? Where am I spiritually? Am I where I need to be? Am I allowing things in that don't need to be there? Do I need to get rid of some of my habits? Do I need to have clean hands and a clean heart? Psalms 24 and 34 says, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? Who has clean hands and a pure heart? And then he talks about in James, says, Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to us. Cleanse your hearts, you sinners, you, and you double-minded people. Drawing near to God, as we draw near to him, we will understand. Again, we begin entering his gates and his courts with thanksgiving. We stop at the altar, and then we pause at the labor, and then we can go into the holy place. And so next week we're going to look at a little bit more, finish this up, and then we'll look at the Lord's Prayer. Any thoughts before we close tonight? I hope this has been an enjoyable lesson for you as much as it was for me. I just thoroughly enjoyed this for myself. Maybe I'm a little selfish, but I just thoroughly enjoyed this for myself because it just brings back so many things that we as Christians, I think, need to revisit to have more joy, more strength, and to understand that Lord loves us. Any thoughts before we pray? Lord, we just thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that we can come to your throne room and we can visit with you, Lord Jesus. We thank you that we can come and dine with you. And Lord, I pray that you will just meet each of our needs as we go. Watch over us. And we just want to thank you praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.